All right, greetings, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and get started about a minute early. I hope you'll forgive me. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to the third in the series of CAV-related seminars in the month of July. Uh, my name is Dr. Cody Stoley from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. I'm a research assistant professor with the Nebraska Transportation Center and specifically the Midwest Roadside Safety Facility. My contact information is shown here. I'm going to be presenting on a novel paradigm for vehicle guidance using lane keeping uh, via vehicle to infrastructure communication. Uh, this research is being conducted in part with, uh, in combination with our partners in computer science and engineering here at UNL, as well as uh, by a grant with a co-PI in Ohio State University. Before I get started on my topic, I wanted to highlight uh, the role of Matsy, uh, who was the primary beneficiary or the primary sponsor for this research effort. Um, the Mid-America Transportation Center is a Region 7 USDOT University Transportation Center. Uh, UNL is the lead agency of a handful of different universities in the Midwest region. Uh, the theme of MATSI is to improve safety and minimize risk associated with the increasing multimodal freight movements in the U.S. Uh, across the U.S. surface transportation system. And the MATSI website is shown at the bottom. Uh, here you can see uh, the various universities that uh, contribute to the MATSI in partnership, uh, along with the university boards, uh, University of Nebraska-Lincoln, of course, University of Nebraska Medical Center, University of Nebraska-Omaha, Nebraska Indian Community College, the University of Iowa, Missouri S&T, Lincoln University, uh, Kansas Medical Center, as well as the University of Kansas. Now, the theme of this particular webinar is a role of vehicle, uh, smart and connected vehicles, and how we can prevent runoff road crashes. Um, every year, there is a significant loss in the United States that results from vehicular crashes. A runoff road crashes account for more than half of the annual 35,000 deaths, um, and they result in billions of dollars in lost dam in damages, lost wages, lost productivity, road congestion, um, and then tremendous societal costs. Um, societal costs are very difficult to measure, and so we try usually to estimate how that is affected economically speaking, but personally, the losses are significant. Uh, connected and automated vehicles provide an opportunity to reduce the number of crashes in a variety of different ways through on-road crashes, but as well the opportunity exists to prevent or reduce or mitigate the effect of runoff road crashes as well. Uh, what I will be discussing today are the role of connected and automated vehicles with respect to the runoff road crashes, um, all around the centered focus of the research conducted through the Mid-America Transportation Center Smart Barrier Project. Uh, before I get into the details of this particular project and what's been accomplished, I want to highlight some of the vehicle dynamics and road design parameters, uh, which are constitutive, which we use throughout this project, as well as to summarize really at an overview level, the amount of work and the, the content and production that came out of this Matsy Smart Barrier project. Uh, you can see here the content that's gonna be discussed. And with respect to connected and automated vehicles and runoff road crashes, um, it's important for us to understand what systems are in existence and being developed at the moment. Um, most of the connected and automated vehicle systems, uh, the first generations existed with the advanced driver assistance systems or ADAS. Now ADAS uh, exists all the way along the SAE spectrum of vehicle autonomy, typically between one and three. Um, mostly focused around warnings and alerts, although the more advanced versions of the ADAS systems like advanced adaptive cruise control and machine vision can actually provide some amount of guidance or throttle control or braking assistance uh, to the vehicle as well. Uh, it is a, a fairly safe and, and uh, easy thing to say that the goal of the ADAS systems are to avoid or mitigate crashes entirely. Uh, the automated driving systems are the next generation of ADAS, uh, typically building on the operation of these ADAS systems, but now allowing for full vehicle control in limited or extended circumstances. Now, automated driving systems examples can include platooning, where a series of connected vehicles will follow the leader. Um, there's remote versus onboard full control of vehicles. Uh, some of the autonomous shuttles that are currently in place will have full vehicle control over its navigation and path. 
However, there are also remote overrides in the event of an error or confusion. Uh, lastly, there are automated driving systems that are related to simply road tracking and lane staying, uh, typically assigned at an SAE level four of autonomy. Um, they're able to remain within the lane, uh, navigate between the lane markers, uh, and proceed indefinitely as long as the visibility of the lane exists. As well as there's some uh, extravehicular operations with vehicle to infrastructure or V2I and vehicle to vehicle communication. Uh, one example of that that was discussed in a previous MATSI seminar was the signal phase and timing work that's being conducted with, F with VTTI um, and in partnership with the Virginia Department of Transportation. Um, functionally, the role of CVA CAVs uh, requires an iterative process that has to be completed multiple times uh, to continue to keep the vehicle in the lane. The first step, of course, is to identify what is the road geometry or the target path the vehicle has to be conducting. Uh, after the road geometry is identified and determined, the vehicle itself has to be localized with respect to that road. Now, that could be with respect to the target path or with respect to a lane edge, for example. Next, the vehicle has to calculate its current positional and trajectory error from the target or the idealized path, uh, estimate what trajectory is needed to either remain on or correct the trajectory and resume the path, uh, as well as to perform those maneuvers and then proceed on loop. Now, when we look at how that is actually manifest in the real world, these CAVs, uh, here's an example, just simply uh, an on-vehicle recorded route uh, showing part of the scene through a Canadian province. Uh, you can see clearly that this is a center mounted camera on the vehicle. You can see the lane edges and the, and the vehicles in the uh, approach. And the way that the ADAS and CAV systems will work is first the lanes themselves uh, are identified, defining the route that the vehicle needs to remain within. The vehicle trajectory itself is estimated and then correction factors are identified and applied to help the vehicle continue to navigate that path safely. Now, with the previous two seminars that have been conducted in partnership with uh, the Matsy Smart Barrier Project involved Jason Marks National Instruments. Uh, he spoke at length about hardware for vehicle systems as well as hardware in the loop and simulation efforts. John Barad uh, mentioned specifically with Velodyne and their work with LIDAR and road mapping. Amanda Hamm at Virginia DOT discussed the connected vehicles pooled fund research, as well as the, the role of testing with ADAS and V2I systems. And Fahad had discussed the role of municipality collaboration uh, and the development of a smart map, which has intelligent uh, information about the transportation network. Now, if we look at where those types of research are being conducted, you can see that this is occurring all the way throughout the North America and indeed throughout the world. And the question becomes, how do we connect all of these research efforts together so that we're on a synthetic platform that contains all of the research together? And that was functionally the objective of the Matsy Smart Barrier Project. Our objectives when we began this research effort was to determine a method for retaining vehicles on the road that also had to be unique and complementary to what existed. We neither wanted to eliminate or remove what had already been conducted nor did we want to overlap and conduct research that might be competitive to uh, the exact same objectives and goals. So uh, the functional start for this was complementary. We don't intend to replace, we intend to augment what exists. As well as we wanted to um, implement some additional goals. And those goals included minimizing the sensitivity to your surrounding environment. Um, while many of these ADAS systems work tremendously well when the conditions are favorable. Unfavorable conditions can lead to breakdowns, and breakdowns could mean the difference between safe navigation or the loss of a life. Uh, and as vehicles take over more and more of the controls, uh, there's a potential for an instability or inflection point in safety where drivers become so accustomed to the vehicle navigating on their behalf that the driver's no longer able to safely navigate the vehicle on, on his or her own. Uh, and ergo, we wanted to be able to adapt to various environmental sensitivities, various environmental factors, including lighting that is good or bad, uh, whether that could be rain or snow or sleet, 
um, and could obscure the vision of a driver or an electronic system, as well as dealing with adaptations to the friction on the road and how does the vehicle adapt and change its own safety performance based on how the vehicle can remain on the road. Um, the next question was how do we apply this to roads that are not necessarily the highest traffic, highest volume roads like highways. Um, many of the crashes that are fatal that are occurring on the nation's highways related to runoff road crashes are occurring on rural roads and oftentimes these rural roads may have low service uh, and they may have poor surface conditions. Um, the paint defining the pavement edges may be degraded, or there may not even be pavement. Um, sometimes it's simply dirt or gravel roads, and these roads uh, currently pose a significant problem for a lot of connected and autonomous vehicle systems. And lastly, we wanted to exploit, uh, to exploit and employ the expertise of multiple collaborative agencies together. Uh, we did not want this to be a singular point of ownership. We wanted instead to, to develop an idea and share with the community that could be used and built upon as a foundation for future work. And with respect to that multi-stage collaboration, the final product at this point has been the Matsy Smart Barrier Project, which consists of three different modules. The first module is the road mapping module, and that is the focus of this particular presentation because it is the foundation of how the entire system was intended to work. Um, this road mapping uh, geometry, this road mapping module, will develop the road geometry into a simplified matrix that exists with the minimum amount of data that is necessary to very accurately and precisely define the road, such that it can be transmitted to and from the vehicle and updated remotely as needed. Um, as we determined, this would depend on constitutive properties such as curvature, the number of lanes, and the locations, anchor points throughout the road. However, we can add to it additional augmented data such as pitch and slope, uh, the number of lanes that are consecutive or adjacent, and even lane breakoffs, including turn lanes. The second module is a very important aspect of vehicle to infrastructure communication. This is because we did not anticipate that the vehicle itself would be able to make enough decisions and have enough foresight to be able to plan for upcoming events that would be otherwise obscured due to any number of different factors, congestion, traffic volumes, etc., where a single point observer cannot provide enough information for a vehicle to make good decisions. And lastly, the vehicle path following or retribution aspect, which allows the vehicle to navigate along the path as designed. Now, the question I've often been asked is why can't we just simply use a GPS-based solution to guide vehicles? If we can define the path of the roadway using GPS coordinates, shouldn't we be able to guide the vehicle? So what I wanted to do to answer that question more precisely is to show what a GPS trace for a completely stationary observer would look like over a two hour time period. So this is a two hour time lapse in 30 seconds, showing the GPS position of a stationary receiver. Um, the left side shows its lateral and longitudinal deviation, and the right side shows the elevation map. There are a number of caveats that I should employ. Uh, for one, you're supposed to use these things outside. I did use it inside. So there is uh, some multi-path error, and there are some additional reflection errors that would not be present in an outdoor system. But it should be noted that this is a complete, completely stationary point of observation. So while the errors may be amplified in this particular setup for instrumentation, uh, the result is still the same. And that leads us to the foundations for the vehicle uh, and road geometries and how we define this particular uh, behavior. The first thing first, uh, vehicle path and guidance and navigation is typically operating using a Sere Frenet uh, dynamics formulation. Now Sere Frenet, um, for those of you who may be familiar with the concept is a normal tangential coordinate system. This particular coordinate system is vector-based. It does not have a fixed point coordinate origin. You can define that and move it anywhere you wish. Um, but the coordinate origin for the, the vehicle, the dynamic reference frame, aligns itself with the vehicle's instantaneous velocity. This poses a number of very highly beneficial side effects that we exploited throughout this project. Now, with respect to the vehicle dynamics, there's many ways of representing the vehicle behavior in response to the dynamic input, such as steering and throttle and braking. Um, 
the objective of this particular webinar is not to discuss at length how the vehicles themselves are controlled. Uh, so I would denote that they, many different models exist of various complexities. Obviously, particle dynamics is typically at the level of constitutive calculus. Advanced models usually require some form of computer simulation to implement correctly. And lastly, when we're looking at the road data, um, we evaluated road data topologically in two ways. The first way would be a local Cartesian representation, basically the satellite view or overhead view, and as well as the adding or the augmenting with non-planar data, the, the road grade, the pitch, the rotation or the super elevation of the road itself. When you look at the road design, you're starting with the premise of how roads are supposed to operate with the AASHTO Green Book, how roads are designed by traffic engineers. Now, the Green Book establishes limits of radius of curvature, speed limit, grade, super elevation uh, together in relationship to each other based on how the road is classified or serviced. So highways will have different limits than local roads uh, that have lower service level requirements. Now, within the AASHTO Green Book, uh, designations, there is annotations for friction demand. Uh, friction is easily amongst the, the easiest subjects to get tripped up on. The vehicle, when it's demanding friction, that's how much is being requested, and the, vehicle, the friction supply is what's given between the road tire interface. The vehicle can demand up to, but not exceeding, the amount of uh, road friction that the road can supply. So it is our objective to always be cognizant of what the friction supply is so that we do not ever request that the vehicle demand more friction than the road can supply. And lastly, when you look at road design, it's important to denote that there are functionally three major classes or types of these road segments. And that would be a tangent section that does not curve laterally, a transition section between a tangent and a curve or between consecutive curves, and then a curve section, which uh, would employ throughout the length of that curve a constant radius. Now here shown are some of the Ashto Green Book um, designations for curves and how you would designate uh, various features of those curves. The super elevation is defined as a twist in the road that adds to the available uh, friction that the road can supply by turning or banking with the curve itself. So super elevation can actually increase the vehicle stability at a vehicle speed uh, because of the effect of the twist of the road itself. As well, between consecutive curves or between a tangent and a curve, you'll define a transition, and that transition is usually a, a spiral. Um, the aspects of that spiral will be discussed shortly, but they change the curvature from the initial value to a final value over a length, which is defined and shown here. Now, in U.S. customary units, there are guidelines for what the minimum radius of curvature of the roads are, and that's based largely on the nominal speed limit uh, that are also empirically related to what is demanded from uh, roads from people who have conducted surveys and, and observe how vehicles and people feel comfortable navigating and traversing these roads. When you're looking at the vehicle behavior itself, uh, there's a number of factors that have to be considered simultaneously. Each one of the, the tires and the ability of the tires to provide lateral steering uh, are developed by the tire the road friction interface at each one of the wheels. But for a lot of the lower dynamic conditions wherein the steering is low and the turn radius is fairly large and the speeds are relatively low, then a bicycle model is, is a sufficient way to mimic the vehicle behavior in a simplistic way. The bicycle model of the vehicle guidance is shown to the left. Now, all of these factors were used throughout the process here, but I'm not going to dive into uh, considerable more detail in that respect. You're looking at the saray frenet formulation of the tangent normal velocities. I know what you're really defining here is how does the vehicle behave? Uh, the vehicle velocity vector aligns with the tangent, and the normal defines how it's turning. So as the tangent moves, the normal moves with that tangent. And in a 2D plane, that's all the only coordinate system that you're going to need. What is the direction I'm traveling in now, or the T vector, and which is the direction I'm turning in now, that's the N vector. Some of the constitutive relationships are shown below. But again, I don't want to dive too far into the mathematical formulation here. 
What we observed when we were looking at defining the road was that there were one set of friction values that are used in road design. And that is the friction that is estimated the vehicle can safely navigate. Um, and that's typically assumed to be the wet condition. So if the road is wet, the vehicle can travel at the designated speed limit without having to adjust or reduce speed while still safely remaining on the road and completing all the trajectories as needed. Now, dry roads obviously have a substantially increased friction supply. Uh, wet roads may have uh, average tire pavement interface friction that might range between 0.6 to 0.8 in terms of friction supply. Dry roads might be as high as 1.4 in very specific applications with good tires and excellent pavement. But on the other hand, icy or snowy roads, slick roads, might have friction that drops as low as 0.1 to 0.2. Uh, and this is a huge range of available frictions. For human drivers, humans are simply expected to be able to adapt to changes in road friction supply uh, automatically using their own driving experience. But in an autonomous system, this has to be adapted uh, and integrated into the control system itself. As well, when you're looking at the friction supply, when you're on a tangent road and you are not turning and you are not neither accelerating nor braking, the amount of friction demand that your vehicle is requesting from the road is pretty limited. It's only the amount needed to overcome the air resistance and the mechanical resistance within the vehicle. So the amount of, of force between the tire and the pavement in the longitudinal direction is pretty low. But when you're turning, then there is this additional amount of friction being demanded that's related to the centripetal acceleration. And as it turns out, that was constitutive to how we operated with this road data matrix. Now, give me a chance to digest that much. The foundation of all of the Matsy Smart Barrier Project really comes down to the application of what we call the Midwest Discrete Road Curvature, or MDRC formulation. Um, those who might be adept might understand that we actually implemented all of our initials um, were opportunistically included in that designation as well. Now, the objective of the MDRC formulation is to convert the geometry of the road to discrete point matrices using cross-sectional properties of the road. And by that, I'm referring to basic components of the road. What is the road position? What is the curve, the curvature at that exact moment in time represented in a vector way? Uh, what are the speed limits? What are the target points that you're supposed to be navigating, i.e. the lane center line? And as well, how can we augment that with additional road data? And from there, we developed the applications of the surface tangent angle. Uh, I'll cover that here briefly. The cardinal direction of travel, north, south, east, west, how long between every consecutive anchor point or the segment lengths, the road grade, the lateral slope, and the super elevation parameters, these are augmented parts of the road data that once determined can be added to the really basic parts. As well, using uh, the appropriate amount of formulas, we can smooth and filter the input data to control from some instantaneous variations and instabilities so that the road travel is very smooth, that it, that it produces a known amount of lateral acceleration at every instant in time, and that you can develop uh, a large variation in the number of lanes uh, the constitutive operations, and uh, further behavior of the vehicle on the road itself. In order to conduct this road data matrix, we started with some simplifications. Uh, the first thing first, uh, Saray Fernet works terrifically, but if we have to operate in three space, um, that makes life very difficult. So we limited the Saray Fernet to a 2D Cartesian plane or if you will, an overhead view, like a satellite view. By doing so, that ensures that the third vector needed in a coordinate system, or the binormal, is now aligned with a vector that is perpendicular to the road surface, or pointed right at a satellite, if you will. As well, we gain the benefit of a Saray Fernet because it's vector-based, based on velocity, which is how things change over time, it doesn't have a fixed coordinate origin that it depends to define the route at all times. Uh, and by doing so, we can, at any given instant in time, move our reference frame to a different point. 
uh, opportunistically and redefine the road coordinates because the vectors did not change by moving the coordinate origin. And in this way, we can take advantage of the fact that we can be anywhere on the Earth and the operation will still be mathematically sound. Even if you were by the North or the South Poles, where the changes in latitude are significantly different than the changes of longitude for a given unit displacement, uh, this system will still continue to work. Now, what that actually looks like here, I'm not going to cover this in great detail. This is covered by my uh, PhD student, uh, Ricardo Hakome, um, in a paper that's just shown at the bottom. But functionally speaking, every three consecutive anchor points can be used to define an instantaneous curvature. And then you sequence those pieces of curvature and you can linearly connect those in space and you develop a discrete curvature model. And that discrete curvature model might have some random noise as what's shown up in the top right hand corner. When you do this calculation iteratively, uh, every now and again, you'll have some noise that will vary away from a nominal value. But if you use a good degree of, of filtering, an example is a wavelet based filter, but you can use a, a different kind of filter as well. Uh, then you can realign these vectors and form a very smooth road path. And the supplementary benefit is by smoothing the input data, you're also redefining the anchor points such that they're intrinsically consistent. All of these arrows that are shown in the left-hand diagram correspond to an instantaneous tangent or a T vector on the road at that instant in time. Once you realign it, those T vectors remain where we desire them to be, which is a smooth centerline trajectory of the road. The supplementary benefit is when you use this curvature and you found the vector of curvature, we can define a number of parallel curves that are orthogonal along that said same curvature vector, and we can define parallel lanes. So you only have to define, at a given moment, a single lane and then a lateral offset to the next consecutive lane, and you can define as many lanes as you would like. Uh, there are, of course, limits to how this can work. If you define the rightmost outer lane, you have to be very cautious that you don't cause any inversions on the leftmost lane. Uh, so it is advantageous to begin working on this from the left-hand lane and moving outward. Uh, nonetheless, the operation is very smooth. Uh, this is an example shown using MATLAB codes for how uh, the application of the Bertrand curves and the, the parallel lanes work, both in terms of parallel lanes that have very large separation here, shown 30 meters, it's just exaggerated for the purpose of showing uh, the, how the application would work, as well as the opposing lanes. And that simply reverses the tangent vector. It's still parallel, but now the vehicle's traveling in the opposite direction. And the next question would come, how would we ever go about developing this? The math behind it seems to work, but creating this data matrix could be challenging. And so we evaluated the alternative methods of coming up with this road data matrix. And that data input uh, found to be relatively robust despite a number of different opportunities. You could use GNSS coordinates, such as if you take a vehicle, you equip it with GPS, and you collect road data, and if you collect enough of them, then you can create an averaged lane path out of all of that GPS data, which will be very accurate overall. Um, another potential opportunity would be using satellite views and optic data. You can redefine and establish approximate road parameters, and as long as those road parameters are within a reasonable uh, tolerance of, of what is needed, then you can go back through and use the AI post smoothing method that Ricardo had discussed and developed, and you can realign those to the actual road center line. Um, there are even further methods of doing it, including surveys, including elevation data, including topology, uh, et cetera. So the nice part is that it is relatively independent of how the data is produced. It can still use within the MDRC formulation. The output of this data is the instantaneous data at a given point. It's an anchor point that is associated with an instantaneous curvature, a surface tangent, I'll, I'll cover that just next. And then from that data, we can actually derive segment lengths, 
We can define the cardinal headings, which is the north, south, east, west, uh, as well as a maximum safe travel speed. Um, using the knowledge about the speed limit, as well as the curvature in the location, it may be found that in some locations, it is needed to reduce the travel speed to a lower value because of a, a limitation on the maximum safe speed. I'll cover that as well a little bit later. Um, as I noted before, when by using the Cartesian map, we have one third vector that we're not using, that's called the binormal, and that's perpendicular to the road. Um, and as a result of that, with the normal and tangent vectors, we don't have the exact same behavior of north, south, east, west rotation for a given movement in any given direction. If you're in Canada and you travel uh, one meter to the northeast, it produces a different change in your latitude and longitude than if you're traveling from Miami and you're traveling one meter to the northeast, even if those two trajectories are parallel. And that is because the surface tangent vector is related to the yaw or the rotation of this theta vector shown on this diagram, whereas the cardinal travel vector is related to latitude and longitude. While lines of longitude will intersect the center of the Earth, lines of latitude uh, are depending on different circumferences, depending on how far you are away from the equator. So therefore, we, we converted the surface tangent vector based on vehicle yaw into a cardinal direction, a northing and an easting. It just depends on where you're at in terms of your anchor position, your latitude and your longitude. And what comes out of all of this MDRC method is a number of different pieces that the vehicle can use to make sure that it's on the right path. You can get a compass direction, a cardinal direction, you can have a yaw rate that corresponds to how fast the vehicle should be changing its own alignment, as well as a position offset. How far am I away from where I should be at a given moment? <clears throat> With respect to the vehicle dynamics, <clears throat> the velocity and the curvature of the vehicle <clears throat> can be correlated with the lateral acceleration we measured on the vehicle, and they don't have to be converted uh, into a different reference frame. And as well as some derivable relationships. These are things that can be done live based on the environmental data. Include things like the maximum safe travel speed. If there are adjustments to the friction supply on the road, for example, from reduced friction from ice or snow, then you can autonomously adjust the maximum safe travel speed the vehicle can operate at without having to go through an extensive uh, reevaluation or single tire based uh, estimation of what speed the vehicle should be working with. And that functionally brings us to the second module. Now, when we're looking at the V2I, the objective with our V2I system is to keep the vehicle informed at all times. What are the road conditions? Where is the vehicle at? Now, that is not part of this particular MANSI project, just to control the scope and the amount of work. Uh, so that is, largely being governed and navigated uh, by my collaborators, Dr. Jean Veron, the Computer Science Department here at UNL, and Dr. Ayla Nakichi at the CARS Lab at, at Ohio State University. They're going to be piloting a lot of that work. In fact, uh, next week, we are planning to have a seminar with Dr. Veron talking about V2I interaction. Uh, that is not going to be the focus of this particular lecture year. Now, the objectives of our V2I system itself, though, is to act as a waypoint for the vehicle to know not only where it's at in space, but how it needs to be correcting its own matrix. Most of the roads throughout the country, throughout the world, are principally static. They don't change very much in terms of their basic geometries. And hence, we don't expect significant changes to curvature, to anchor points, to tangent vectors, et cetera all of these things that are so basic to how the vehicle can navigate itself. And therefore, knowing that matrix one time is helpful. And instead, we only need to identify what updates need to occur. Road construction projects, work zones, uh, for example, lane closures, emergency medical services or emergency response, um, as well as how do things need to change because of the environment. If visibility is poor, if the friction supply from the road is poor, 
then we have to be able to adapt to that uh, environmental changes. And by communicating to the vehicle that, that the conditions have changed, this is no longer a dry road. This is a new environment that you need to readapt to. And long term, we expect that the V2I could be used with applications to transportation as a service in terms of mobility, road scheduling. If you say, hey, I'm here, I want to travel to uh, the supermarket. It would be potential using this V2I based system to schedule your route in terms of when you're going to be on that road and with what other vehicles. Uh, and hence, knowing your exact travel time uh, would be an essentially an upgrade to the current estimation used by Google Maps or Apple Maps. As well as this would provide an application for an emergency evacuation scheduling. If you understood what routes are highly congested and what routes may have less vehicular travel, you may be able to more efficiently plan your evacuation. Um, and as noted, the core constitutive aspect of the V2I, besides the ability to update in terms of dynamics, what's going on with the road, is the vehicle has to have an augmentation of its position. GNSS alone is not enough. Uh, the accuracy and the drift of, of a GPS-based solution does not currently provide enough accuracy to keep vehicles safely on the road without colliding with other vehicles. Uh, and that is why every system that's currently being used by major manufacturers does have some degree of augmentation, either through uh, optics and machine vision to identify lane edges or features around which it must stay in place, um, or even using machine vision-based depth perception systems. Uh, LIDAR systems to define the road path and the coordinates. All of these are augmentation to help the vehicle understand its own environment and where it needs to be within that environment. And therefore, these things are very critical to augment to this system as well. And potentially, they could be collaborative. A V2I-based solution uh, is, was perceived to be one of the easiest methods because of the ability to provide uh, instantaneous updates to the vehicle data. However, it is uh, important to note that the alternative methods of helping the vehicle understand its place would also work with the road data matrix as proposed. So you could still use a LIDAR complement to the vehicle solution to help with its guidance. You could still use a machine optics complement to help the vehicle understand its position. However, it's also anticipated that if, you, if a V2I solution is implemented, it also allows the vehicle to talk back to the infrastructure and help other vehicles, uh, denoting the friction demand that could be derived from the uh, ABS tire data, the road congestion, how many other users are around this vehicle. Uh, from LIDAR solutions and radar solutions, you can identify if there are other road users in the vicinity. And therefore, uh, if I can put it pejoratively, uh, the vehicle that's connected on the V2I system could be a tattletale to tell what other vehicles or how many other vehicles are currently around the target vehicle. And lastly, if in an autonomous system, if drivers are no longer principally responsible for the vehicle navigation, it therefore becomes important for the autonomous vehicle to provide some supplemental benefits back to the system, including the event of a crash, uh, whether or not there's a pothole and creating a large vertical uh, acceleration in a location, et cetera. And these things become possible using a V2I basis. Now, there's a lot of needs left. Uh, as I mentioned, this is not really the focus of this research. We're looking more at parameterizing how we could benefit from it within the MDRC method. Um, and the needs include a robust degree of cybersecurity, uh, controlling how this road and path is modified remotely, uh, controlling when and how those changes are made, how to implement automatic updates. Uh, you know, there are benefits from a, a crowdsourced or a ways, if I can put it that way, approach for identifying the parameters in the dynamics of the, of the travel situations. Uh, and how do we implement in some EMS behaviors? We want to be able to have this to be broad ranging and potentially even including agricultural vehicles. Um, there are some V2I systems that are currently being tested and evaluated and have some degree of, of implementation plan for the near future. So if we can integrate in with uh, signal phase and timing, signalized intersections and smart HUD notifications, that would be best. 
uh, what's the, the objective. Now, last when we're looking at vehicle controls, it's important to touch on how vehicles themselves are able to guide themselves and remain within the path. And so we're proposing an architecture of vehicle corrections and guidance. Um, again, trying, uh, potentially not succeeding in keeping this simple enough to, to discuss. Uh, we wanted to look at how the vehicle dynamics fundamentally relates back to the road data. And as much as possible, avoiding conversion type problems or integration related issues that can implement uh, problems such as drift or differentiation errors. So we wanted to make a one-to-one -one correspondence with the things that the vehicle can know and can measure on itself and relate it back to the road data for the simplest form of error estimation possible. Now, in order to do that, we looked at things like the steer angle. What's shown here to the right is the, the estimated steer using the bicycle model assumptions of the Ackerman steer condition. That's shown in degrees based on the wheelbase of the vehicle and the radius of curvature, as well as the understeer gradient uh, calculated on the vehicle that determines how the steer angle deviates from the nominal value. What we can do is if you know the, the wheelbase of the vehicle, which you will have its own knowledge of, the curvature is fed by the road, and therefore the vehicle is going to be better able to estimate and predict its own steer angle response that's going to be needed not just now, but in the near future based on the road data. As well as we can implement in different kinds of suspension reactions to dynamically measure and compare the road twist or the roll of the road or the super elevation. The vehicle itself will have some dynamic roll uh, that's caused by lateral weight shift during a turn. If we can relate that back to the super elevation, we might be able to control and monitor the vehicle roll in real time to make sure that the vehicle remains stable. Well, we need to be able to know how far we are away from the idealized path. So here is shown uh, two different techniques, uh, one of which uses a local nearest neighbor to two consecutive anchor points that are on the road center line. And if the vehicle can know both its, its error from both of those two and compare it to the ideal path, uh, the vehicle can then resume its position using, uh, for example, uh, some various modeling or uh, mathematical approaches. You could also conduct a, a time of flight estimation using some known reference points in the past you can estimate how fast you, how far you have traveled since a data point, and therefore define a longitudinal horizon that you should be looking at in terms of uh, an orthogonal uh, error to the desired path. A lot of these techniques are complementary. They allow the vehicle position to be known in a fairly good degree of accuracy, uh, as long as they're correlated with an additional system like V2I. Not just knowing that, but you can also know the, the future of the vehicle, what route is needed to return to the path and remain on the path. If you know the geometry of the road that's upcoming, you also know what's estimated in terms of the demand of the yaw rate, how fast the vehicle needs to be turning to the left or the right. Um, you can estimate the demand that the vehicle is going to require in order to return to a path from that deviation. Uh, and if your model becomes sufficiently complicated, you could begin to look at how the friction varies if the vehicle even partially leaves the road and enters onto a shoulder. Um, such is well beyond the, the scope of this particular presentation. However, we did investigate how boundary stability would affect the ability to control the vehicle path if vehicle wheels do leave the roadway. Uh, and that was to define how tightly this control had to be applied in order to keep the vehicle on the road. In order to do that, we looked at what's called a split mu testing. The vehicle was accelerated to 55 miles per hour and braked to a stop. We used a different variety of surfaces as well as transitions that had different friction coefficients and then compared how the vehicle was able to come to a stop, its average friction, as well as the, the braking induced yaw on the vehicle to investigate how the vehicle is stable under a variety of very challenging situations. What we observed out of that effort was that split mu in general produced better overall friction than braking alone on those said same surfaces. Uh, for example, when we combined 
the effect of grass and concrete, such that two wheels were on grass and two wheels were on concrete, we saw a substantial rise in the average friction compared to if the vehicle was solely on the grass. And this means that if the controls are being applied to the vehicle in an emergency way, and the vehicle partially leaves the road, there's still a strong degree of control available to guide the vehicle back to the roadway. Uh, and that really poses a nice benefit to any control system. Now, sometimes these were diminished. For example, on sand, we did not see a good behavior exhibited from a split mu condition. In fact, the, the average friction decreased. And this was believed to be affected by uh, the challenges of the operation of anti-lock brake systems to try to prevent vehicle wheels from locking up. So when that was in a split mu condition, we actually saw a very slight reduction in the average friction. But another consideration there is how does braking or alternating the amount of braking on each wheel affect the vehicle yaw? And in general, what we would see is that on the highest friction conditions, any variation in the timing of the brakes on each wheel would produce a very small degree of vehicle yaw. In this case, looking at like five to six degrees on just straight concrete. When we looked at split mu, we actually saw a slight reduction in the overall amount of yaw induced by braking itself. Now the yaw, it should be noted here, is this is how the vehicle is turning with respect to the road or the path. And the objective of all of this was the driver was to not touch the steering wheel throughout the braking event. Hence, the yaw that was being induced changes the orientation of the vehicle with respect to its original path, or causing it to skid. It's a lot of information. I hope that it's, uh, it's not too overwhelming. So I'm going to wrap it up in, in the simplest way that I can. The MDRC formulation to develop the road data matrix was what we determined to be foundational to a very good synthetic design that allows end-to-end -end vehicle navigation in a variety of different circumstances. The basis of this was on the, the constitutive properties of curvature, on vectors, and local position or anchor points. As well as we can take that road data and supplement with additional information at a given point, such as a speed limit, the, the friction supply, the pitch of the road, uh, the sl side slope of the road or the super elevation, the number of lanes, lane widths, et cetera. And a lot of these pieces can be augmented to a data matrix without significantly expanding the amount of uh, communication that's required to inform the vehicle. Second, we recommended a V2I-based solution for vehicle localization as well as to provide updates to this road matrix. And lastly, we still left the vehicle itself to come up with its own self-navigation, the requirements needed to remain on the roadway and within the parameters. Uh, we feel that the vehicle and the onboard processors are still the most effective way. And there's a tremendous amount of research that has already been completed that could be implemented into a broader system like this. And thus, this complementary solution could benefit from the existing work and even work with that existing work. With the MDRC formulation I, I touched on previously and would append here, that, that can be developed through a broad, broad variety of data sources. Uh, satellite views, overhead views, GNSS traces from crowdsourced, uh, LIDAR maps either conducted live or from a reference database. And the bonus about LIDAR maps uh, is that they can also identify nuances of the road, including its slopes, its pitch, uh, the lane widths. These are all very nice attributes. Machine vision, as long as it's used with stereo cameras and depth perception, might be able to develop the same kinds of outputs that LIDAR can. Um, this work is robust. It has been verified through computer simulation models. Uh, in terms of exploring the effects of variance on different parameters, and it turns to be uh, minimally varied. So it's going to depend on the accuracy of any given sensor, but numerically speaking, it's very robust against minor nuances or even static and white noise in the background. Uh, and lastly, these systems could be implemented in with existing research efforts like hardware in the loop. Uh, to investigate the vehicle controls and reactions to this feed-through data. It's going to require some more programming, and that's just some additional work. And there's a significant amount of work left to be done. Uh, 
but this is still a complementary solution to what exists. And of that work to be done, we recommend uh, that this next application use the road data matrix first and develop path networks. And those path networks can then be implemented into exchange information with the vehicle, the V2I hardware, uh, and then begin to even develop smart maps, uh, similar to what uh, Fahad had shown with the OGRA and Macavo in Ontario, implementing in dynamic maps that show real-time behavior and data that also have uh, a back end that is detailed road data would benefit all the road users as well as uh, those who are road asset managers. But perhaps the most fundamental thing that I can recommend is to ensure the continued robustness of the system. It's one thing to develop the data. It's quite another thing to implement it. If this were to become a primary navigation method, uh, it will be absolutely of the highest essentiality to ensure the vehicle remains in the center line where it's desired to be. And that means no aberrant lane definitions. You don't want to be running vehicles off of the road. You need to ensure appropriate redundancy checks. If a machine vision system says the lane curls left and this system says the lane curls right, uh, that's going to have to be dealt with in terms of a resolution. And lastly, in terms of how and when to conduct overrides and who is enabled and allowed to conduct those that same overrides. Still a significant amount of work to be done. Now, I mentioned at length the role with V2I and how we expect that to work. Uh, Dr. Varan is going to be presenting on this, it's targeted for next week. I believe that's still anticipated, although right now I don't have uh, the final details to share with you, and I will provide it when I have that. Uh, now, the last day, I wanted to thank a number of different individuals. I wanted to really thank all of our guest speakers. I'm sorry, Jason and John didn't make that list. My apologies, that's an oversight. Uh, but I did want to thank Amanda and Fahad. I wanted to thank Matsy and all of the program directors and all of the sponsor board. Uh, in particular, thank you to the Midwest Roadside Safety Facility where I am engaged uh, and the Midwest Pool of Fund Program. It's a collection of state DOTs which are tremendously engaged with the safety aspect. And uh, there's 21 state DOTs. I apologize, I can't go through all of them. Thank you all. Most of all, I want to thank my two graduate students who put in the most amount of effort on this. Michael Swigart, who's now down with, uh, I apologize, Michael, I cannot remember, now Sandia National Labs. And Ricardo, who's still with me, he's going to graduate in December. So with that, I will be happy to take any questions or comments. see one of the comments asking if there will be links to download this presentation. That's absolutely true. Yes, I will provide both a PDF and, and as well as uh, the PowerPoint, which does have some videos in it. I'd be happy to share that. One of the questions that had just come in, um, there's still a lot of work to be done. And what was the reasonable time frame to be implemented into this? Um, that's an excellent question. It's a fantastic question. And it's a hard one. Uh, V2I solutions and ADAS solutions have currently been in process for more than 10 years. Some of the earlier efforts on vehicle autonomy uh, range to the early 2000s, even the late 1990s. Um, Anti-lock brake systems, if you want to consider that uh, one of the earliest generation of ADAS, um, that was even late 80s, early 90s for full implementation. I think that this effort is going to take a significant degree of robustness first. And given the current scale and progress, uh, despite the great acceleration of work, uh, if we proceeded with a full adoption of the MDRC method for road data mapping, I still anticipate that this would take uh, potentially five to 10 years to begin to work with the vehicle synthesis of that road data. So it's going to depend heavily on how quickly we can begin the road mapping, either through targeted corridors or broad uh, statewide uh, mapping efforts. Uh, this is what's critical before we can proceed to the next step. If you have any further questions? Otherwise, it looks like uh, we could end five minutes early.
All right, everybody. I thank you very much for your kind attention. Uh, feel free to reach out to me with any questions. I provided my contact information at the beginning, and I would be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you very much for tuning in. I look forward to hearing from you in the future. Thank you, Cody, from Matsy.